Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you are doing well. Here is today's plan. We're going to talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about logistics for the next few weeks. Things will get a little bit different after this week. Uh, then we have three poll news presentations I'll go through. We'll talk about your responses to the prompts about what happened in 2016. And then we'll spend the rest of the time talking to the KU polling and election expert, Dr. Patrick Miller. So let's start with questions from you. What do you want to know? Uh, I, I have a question on margin of error. Yeah. Uh, I was just seeing the other day uh, how, like, there's states with uh, mail-in ballots, how uh, it's, like, there's a partisan gap in how it will probably favor Trump in, uh, in ballots that get rejected first, Democrats and Republican. I was just wondering if that's, like, stuff that's calculated into the margin of error. Uh, no, that would not be calculated in the margin of error, but we can ask uh, Professor Miller in a little bit about um, what the state of all that is of early ballots. Um, remember, margin of error uh, really only has to do with the number of people that are in your sample. So it, nothing, nothing else really affects the margin of error. But interesting question. Other thoughts? I know one of the reasons why um, the 2016 polls were a little off was because of a large sample of college students but I still don't have an understanding of like how they wouldn't have like accounted for that in 2016 when they were like in college towns, for example, like I wonder if there's a specific way they measure that out. Um, I don't know. Again, a great question to ask Professor Miller in a little bit, okay? Let's save both of those for him. Um, We'll, we'll fly through the content today and devote most of the class to talking with him. Other questions? Okay, here's what's happening uh, in this class over the next few weeks. So as you know, Tuesday is election. Uh, I'm not giving you any more tasks to work on over this weekend and next week. I want you to be working on your video and I want you to be uh, picking your poll for the final poll project that'll be due in December. Um, so the poll has to come out before the election. So this is these are the days when you get to pick the poll you want to work with. Otherwise, you're going to be looking back in news to this week. So it's probably easier just to pick a poll that comes out this weekend um, or Monday. Uh, next Thursday, we're not going to have a lecture. I'll be here at 2.30 like this, and we can chat if you want to come and talk about the election and polls and anything else. Uh, but I won't have formal content um, or anything like that. So uh, over the next week, wa work on your videos and then pick a final poll. Your videos are due, uh, the first cut of the video is due on Sunday, November 8th. After that, we have two weeks between next week and Thanksgiving. And so we'll do four workshops with your videos. So you and your team are going to sign up for one of the days when we would have class. 
So either a Tuesday or a Thursday over the next, over those next two weeks. And I'll send you an email early next week with a sign up for that. Uh, but basically you will come to class. Uh, there'll be about seven or eight, 10 videos in that class. We'll watch through them. We'll comment on them. We'll give each other feedback. Um, and then you'll also get written feedback from uh, your classmates. So you don't need to worry about any, any of this right now. All of this will be in my email that'll come uh, probably Monday, maybe Tuesday. Uh, but just th think ahead to that so that out of those two weeks, you just need to attend one of those four sessions. The final videos will be due uh, November 25th, which is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And then your final projects do no December 10th. So once we get started um, editing the videos and doing the workshops, I'll give you more information about the final project so you can work on that ahead of time. Uh, any quick questions about any of this? Uh, I know this is a lot of things to process and I promise I'll go step by step with this in the next few weeks. Okay. So we have three poll news presentations. Uh, here's the first one from Alex, Maddie, Dan, and Anthony about Arizona. This is from earlier in the month. Uh, it's a New York Times Siena poll. Uh, Joe Biden at that point was leading 49% uh, to 41%. The margin of error was 4.2%. I was hoping that I would see the margin of error uh, graph, or at least the mention of whether the margin of error overlaps. I don't see that here, which is too bad. Uh, but it's, it's really like the first step you guys should take whenever you see a poll result, right? And if it lists a margin of error, calculate what is the, um, what is the margin a, a, around each prediction? Is that, an, is there an overlap? And is that communicated accurately in the news that's describing the poll? Uh, but, but, but they talk a little bit about the news report, seemed a little slanted towards Biden, uh, talking about Trump's debate performance as being caustic and so on. Um, and some accurate comments about that. Another poll news by Molly, Kathleen, Katie, Hannah, Will, and Emma. This one was done a little later in the month and it sounds like it's uh, a national poll. Nine hundred and eighty two likely voters. Uh, support uh, 44.7 for Trump versus 51.7 for Biden. They, uh, they don't call it a margin of error. They call it a credibility interval of 3.2%. Uh, they talk about various factors that the respondents said were uh, important to them. 538 gives it an AB average rating, which is fairly good. Again, it would have been nice to see, um, is there an overlap uh, in the credibility interval between these two, um, these two estimates. Uh, breaks, uh, they break it down a little bit by demographics. So here's overall Trump, Biden, and then age. Uh, so you see that support for Biden is stronger among younger people versus it's stronger for Trump among older people. 
And the third presentation, uh, using the same uh, presentation scheme template. This one per, is from USC. Remember, we had a few of these from USC before. This is a large panel uh, that USC maintains. And they've been doing this poll uh, periodically. Uh, on October 22nd, they said Biden uh, in, leads by 11.4 points. Some interesting graphics. And a lot of little, little letters to read. Okay, so what happened in 2016? Um, we, a few of you read or watched the videos about some of the reasons that uh, the 2016 polls were at least perceived to be off. So Ariana, predictions were off in 2016 because of underrepresentation of non-college educated voters and many undecided third party voters making their decisions to vote for Trump. Polls in 2020 are waiting for education and report considerably fewer undecided voters that, than in 2016. So presumably uh, those two errors or oversights would have been corrected in 2020. Uh, using the reasons above, what critical questions would should we be asking in 2020? So Ariana says, one, are undecided voters going to choose Trump again? Good question. Uh, will Republicans vote on election day, November 3rd, to skew the voting to Trump? Uh, and Trump claims victory, or are Republicans skewing the votes to Biden? Interesting. Daniel, uh, again, similar concerns, what happens in 2016. I believe that the silence from many voters threw the predictions off. Um, so either silence or undecided voters. There were also expectations that one of the candidates was way likely to be voted into office and therefore many opinions were uh, not factored in. What would you be looking for in 2020? With the overall distrust in the polls and given the previous election year, uh, should we automatically expect more, more voters and more action as a response to the lack of presence in the previous cycle? Layla, what are the reasons? Predictions were off in 2016. One of the huge factors that caused predictions to be off uh, was non-response bias, where a group of people systematically don't respond to surveys, which leads to people being surprised by the outcome of the actual election. Although posters would argue that they uh, adjusted for non-response, right? That they they can predict what the electorate's going to look like, and so they can weight those responses. Uh, remember waiting. Um, so they can weight people's responses to make the sample look like the electorate. Another reason is due to the fact that it is difficult to pin down likely voters and make predictions from the unknown number. Uh, using the reasons above, what critical questions should we be asking? What are, what are the ways the public are going to be able to put full trust into the new online polls and how is it going to compare to past forms of polls such as telephone calls? How do the effects of non-voters negatively impact predictions? And finally, Patrick, 2016 failed to accurately wait for minority rep represented groups, as well as large majority of undecided voters swaying the vote in Trump's favor. Pollsters failed to accurately wait for college educated people, um, college educated or not college educated people, which ended up altering the waiting um, to add to this, during the last week of elections, there were 16% of people still undecided. And this is extreme, an extremely large amount 
of undecided voters in the end, the pollsters estimated a 50-50 split between undecided voters, when in reality, a large majority ended up voting for Trump. And some critical questions from Patrick. Uh, what would you be doing? Uh, and so he lists a bunch of different issues, job security, COVID-19, government handling of protests. It's no joke that this year has been especially hard for everyone, but for voters, certain issues like this could swing their vote one way or another. This year, there, there have been a certain percentage of uncertainty due to the abnormality of the year, which will make it increasingly harder for pollsters to estimate um, at the outcomes accurately. Okay. And that's it. I will unshare my screen. And ask Professor Miller, who's been incognito sitting there quietly to join us. We have LaCroix product placement in the corner. Um, Probably. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, so we have a bunch of questions that students submitted uh, ahead of time. And then we also, as you might've heard, had a couple of questions uh, from students just now. So I'll start with the questions that were submitted and then I'll ask you guys to jump in uh, with your other questions, okay? So uh, the first question from Danny, and this is, this, is, this may be a restatement of what we just covered, or it may be new information, uh, but why was there such a disparity between the 2016 election polls and the actual results? Sure. Um, so I think the place to start with this is to first communicate to people that the polls were not as off as you think they are. Um, in reality, we were dealing with discrepancies that were systematic but within the margin of error um and they weren't that bad I, I think i like to reinforce for people up front that i think in 2016 what a lot of people were focused on was what nate silver was saying and nate silver is not doing polling uh, nate silver is doing uh, election modeling when he says Hillary Clinton had a 90% or whatever chance of winning the election by one point or two points or whatever. Um, there was a lot of anger in the polling industry about how they got tarnished by his projections, which weren't interpreted correctly themselves. So separate those two things and just realize that what, we're, what we were dealing with in the polling was actually some rather small errors, but it's errors that um, are troubling for an industry that likes to be accurate. Um, so can I just interrupt you for a second, just for our, my students? We've talked about Nate Silver, not necessarily by name, but we've looked at 538, the 538 website. That's Nate Silver's website. And we've talked about his model, his forecasting model. So that's what Professor Miller were just, was just referring to. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many people I run into who think that what he's doing is just running polls, and it's not. Um, so we have to separate the state polling from the national polling. The national polling was actually pretty good, uh, not that off systematically. Um, on average, you would look at the national polling and say pretty accurate, um, especially engaging the size of Hillary Clinton's popular vote win. Where the discrepancies came in was more in state polling, particularly in Rust Belt states. Um, so, you know, whenever you tackle a problem in polling or any social science, you're always dealing with something that is, is like a stew or a pie or a cocktail or whatever, it has a lot of ingredients in it, but some, but some of those ingredients are going to be more prominent than others. So, like, I heard some of the things that, that your students were talking about, and if they were problems, they were very, very small problems that pollsters can adjust for through things like weighting um, or so forth. You really have to focus on two big things. 
to understand the vast majority of the errors that went into the state polling in 2016. Um, and specifically, those errors were more so on gauging the Trump vote. Um, in our states with the biggest discrepancies like Michigan or, or Wisconsin, the Clinton vote was actually gauged pretty well. Um, there were some differences that were big enough on the Trump vote in states that were already close that you might have been expecting her to win a state like Michigan by a point or two, but then Trump wins up any, winning by 0.3%. And that really comes down to two things. One, as was mentioned, was waiting. Um, so waiting is traditionally done on demographics, particularly age, sex, um, race, um, income sometimes. Traditionally, waiting had not been done on education and pollsters didn't think that it was that big of an issue because education was not that stark of a political divide. Um, but what happened in 2016 was that education actually did become a substantial political divide. Um, you know, the, the two parties are in the middle of a realignment right now where whites with college degrees or some degree of college who often tend to be wealthier whites are getting more democratic and whites without college educations who tend to be lower income whites working class are getting more Republican that have been drifting bigger for 16 years, but it exploded in 2016. And so Trump, Trump's exacerbation of that education divide meant that when you were not controlling, when you were not waiting for education, um, that overrepresentation of more educated whites in surveys meant that you were underestimating a bit Trump's vote. That's a lesson that pollsters corrected for after 2016. Sorry for the moving screen. My computer's at a bit of an angle here and trying to like get it to not fall. Um, so after 2016, pollsters started waiting for education in the midterm elections of 2018 also off-year elections in Virginia, Mississippi, and Kentucky. And polling since 2016 has been quite accurate on average. So we have a three-year track record of seeing what happens now when we wait for education, and the result is systematically more accuracy. The second big factor that you have to put into this is instability in Trump voters. Um, 2016 was a little unusual in how Americans perceived the candidates. Typically in presidential elections, feelings about the two candidates are very set in and most vote intentions are very set in by about Labor Day. Uh, that was not the case in 2016. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump had unusually high negatives and they had, uh, they had an unusually large problem locking down their own party in polling. Hillary Clinton managed to do that before Donald Trump did, but Trump struggled to get to typical levels of, of support from Republicans, about 90%. He struggled with that through election day. So in that last month in particular, you had this problem in polling where Democratic voters had kind of locked in behind Hillary Clinton, which contributed to polling on her numbers being more accurate. Trump voters, you know, Trump was only gauging about 80% of Republicans uh, at that period in time when a normal Republican might be at about 90%. So you have this chunk of Republicans who didn't like Trump very much and they waffled in the polls between, do I vote for Hillary Clinton or Gary Johnson or skip the race or do I just not vote at all? And they were very volatile in that last month. Um, and you also had a lot of events happening in that last month, like uh, the Comey letter, um, you know, like Access Hollywood becoming more of an issue. So that those voters remained very unstable through election day. And when we say that the undecideds ultimately broke to Trump, it's because the composition of the undecideds was unusually skewed towards people who would normally have been Republican but it took till election day for them to stomach voting for Trump. Um, and that was a problem for polls. Polls, polls cannot do anything about voters who are, who are fluid. Um, polls will be most accurate when voters are um, 
stable and solid in their preferences like they are in this election. Um, but the instability that really Trump created with his own base was part of that issue as well. So, you know, again, boil 2016 down to the two biggest pieces of that pie, and it was waiting for education and instability around Trump's vote. And then that created these state level um, relatively small errors, but they were, they, were, they were large enough to turn what looked like narrow Clinton wins in certain states into razor thin Trump wins. All right. Uh, so one thing we've been talking about and students have been expressing in this class is that there is growing mistrust in polls. Um, and so you've talked a little bit about this, but maybe you can expand on this and this perception that polls are inaccurate, polls got it wrong, we shouldn't trust polls. Um, what do you what do you say to to that? Sure, um, that's not a new phenomenon. Um, political scientists have been well have noticed that we don't really study that too much, but we've noticed that really back to the '70s when there started to be more distrust, not just in polling but in other institutions like the media or government. Um, so really for about 40 years now, we've seen this increasing attitude of people saying that I only trust or believe a poll when I like what the poll says. So we know, for example, if you support a candidate and you have a poll that shows that your candidate is ahead, you tend to accept that poll uncritically, even if it's a poorly conducted poll. But if you have a poll that shows that your candidate is losing, then you tend to reject that poll automatically. And in fact, you're very, you're much more engaged to, to nitpick or counter argue against that poll. That's when people start saying, well, how can I believe a poll that only has a thousand respondents, right? It's because you're saying that because your candidate might not be winning. Um, that skepticism is something that the polling industry has tried to fight through greater transparency in its methods. But then, you know, the coverage of 2016 and what happened, of course, undermines a lot of that. Um, you know, it undermines that when you have, for example, Donald Trump talking about polling is fake or it's intentionally done to hurt him. Um, it's also been a problem that's been compounded by the proliferation of, um, you know, unscientific polling, like on BuzzFeed, that's not real polling, but people who are not educated about polling think that it is, or the, the polls you see on MSNBC or Fox, where it's, you can choose to take that poll and decide if you like Trump or not. And then it, you know, surprise, surprise, 90% of people watching Fox approve of the job Trump is doing, or 90% who watching MSNBC disapprove. People think those are polls and they're not. And that's been something that's hurt the industry as well. So there is a lot of concern, you know, in APOR, the American Association for Public Opinion Research, which is the professional association of pollsters, about how to tackle this. But I would say that it's a problem that the industry has not been able to really effectively deal with. So I think it's probably a, a job for journalists and people who do communication about these things to educate people better about what is and what isn't a poll and what um, what makes a good poll and what doesn't. I mean, absolutely. And you know, I I engage with journalists a lot um, when they want to talk about elections. And I would say, you know, in Kansas we have a fantastic press corps that does a very professional job but they run the spectrum on their understanding of polling uh, from the ones who know what questions to ask and know how to report on a poll to the ones who have zero knowledge about how to be critical about the polling that's coming into their inbox. Um, and that is a frustrating thing 
when you're hoping that political reporters, and, and, and it's not just in Kansas, it's, else, it's uh, elsewhere in the country and at a national level, you know, you hope that people who are reporting on a topic have some expertise in what they are talking about, which is why I think it's great that people are taking this class. Um, but unfortunately, that is not always the case. You've talked a little bit about uh, the differences between 2016 and 2020. So you've talked about waiting for education. Uh, some students asked, what are some other differences between 2016 and 2020 polls? Um, have other changes been implemented, new tactics? Um, so those are questions from Dan and Alexa. Um, not really. Um... I mean, the polling industry is constantly adapting to changes in technology, for sure. Um, so we're about 20 years now into figuring out how you can do polling through interactive voice recording, for example, um, or polling with a randomly selected online sample. Um, those adaptations are, are constant. Um, and there, ha there have been, you know, the, really the only big adaptation post 2016 was a greater understanding that we, we now do need to wait for education because it is such a party divide and that can affect our polling estimates. Um, I would say if there's anything that I see this year that is different on the part of the industry, the, the voters are certainly different because the voters this year are much more stable, much more locked into their preferences. Um, very different qualitatively than 2016. The other thing that I see this year is really a proliferation in cheap, low quality polling. Um, you know, I think after 2016, it's been interesting seeing professional pollsters write about this. There were a lot of people who thought, and I, th and I think some of them can accurately be described as probably tech bros from the Bay Area, that polling was this ripe area for them to just jump into and do it better. And so we have this real proliferation in um, cheap, low quality polling being done um, and being sold to campaigns and parties and PACs that don't know any better, or if they know any better, it's they're buying that, that polling because it's cheap. So one of the things that I see this year that I do not like and that I would strongly caution anyone against taking at face value is polling that is done via text message. We started to see this in 2018. Good pollsters said, okay, this, this could be interesting, could be promising, but let's study it before we really start to use it. So what good pollsters are doing right now who are thinking down the road and thinking, how can I start to do a good text message based poll a few cycles from now. They're running a traditional poll and then running a poll on the side where they're using text message based sampling in that. And then they're looking at how those two things differ to begin to make comparisons to study it. What bad pollsters are doing right now is, or, or you know, I would say, I'll, I'll be cautious about the word bad because there are some pollsters who do very good polling but they're, they're selling text message polls to clients who don't know any better. Um, public policy polling, which traditionally does very good polling through IVR, is selling text message polls to, candidate, to, camp, to campaigns because they're cheap and campaigns will buy them. And I understand, like bottom line, make the money, right? Um, but I think it's a bad thing for pollsters right now to be doing text message polls of elections or otherwise and then trying to sell those as being a known quantity. We don't actually know what the problems with those polls are. We don't know if there are systematic skews or biases. We don't know how accurate those kinds of samples are or not. And I see them being reported too often in the press right now as credible, when in reality, there is a huge question mark around them. So note to all of you, if you if you the poll you're doing for your final project has text message in, in it, you might want to write about that. Um, let's Lindsay, you want to ask your question about students and them making up um, the electorate? I guess 
um, to provide an example because a lot of that question was already answered in Douglas County, how would a poll um, way to like take into account the large sample of college students who might be more likely to vote democratic? Well, a poll is not per se going to be concerned about college students necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, in most polling, like normal polling, a poll would be concerned about age for sure and weight by age and weight by education separately. Um, and you know, on that specific point, there was a little bit of uncertainty at the margins in 2016 um, you know, when pollsters are waiting, they're often looking at past exit polls to see what a typical electorate will look like. And then they're adjusting their expectations at the margins around that for what they think is going to happen in the election. Um, Barack Obama brought an unusual number of young people and African Americans out to the polls who showed up when he was on the ballot and then they didn't come back in the midterms for Democrats. The Democrats had really horrible midterms under Barack Obama. And a huge part of that was African-American and young voters of all races not coming back. Um, pollsters weren't sure what would happen with those two groups in 2016. And there was some debate. Do those groups go back down to 2004 levels of turnout? So Kerry Bush, because Obama's not on the ballot anymore. Or do they stay at higher levels of turnout? You know, did Barack Obama represent a new um, vesting of interest for them in presidential politics? Um, pollsters generally assumed that turnout would go back down to 04 levels. Um, and in fact, that's what happened with African-American and youth turnout. It went back down to John Kerry levels. So that ended up being a smart guess by most pollsters. Um, there were a few polling firms that were a little too generous in how they weighted African-American voters and young voters um, and might have contributed in some polling at the margins to maybe some of the discrepancies that we saw. Um, you know, if you are doing a poll of, you know, the US or even just Kansas, the college student issue is going to be a relatively minor problem in that, um, or arguably not much of a problem. You know, if you're going to poll Kansas, um, most of your college students in Lawrence or Wichita also live somewhere else in the state. So it's not really the fact that they're concentrated in a community is not per se much of an issue. If you were to do a poll specifically of a college community. Um, so it's poll specifically of Douglas County. Um, then that could be more of an issue because a large chunk of our population here is quite transient. So I think if, if, if you want to poll just Lawrence, then you'd have to be very specific up front about what your population is. Um, is your population all of the people who live here, in which case you want to interview those college students, or is your population the people who live here full time, in which case students who come in just for school would not be counted in that. Um, and so you could deal with the student issue just by screening those respondents out up front. And maybe you can do that because of how you've constructed your sample for something like address-based sampling, or maybe you're your sampling from the voter roll, something like that. But you can, you can sometimes solve much of that through the sampling process itself. You'd also want to include, you know, if you just wanted to survey full-time Lawrence residents, you could include a question that asks whether someone is a full-time Lawrence resident or they're just here for school. And if they say, you know, I just live in Lawrence for school, you could say, well, thank you. Have a nice day, bye-bye. Um, I don't think that's an issue that you would really then deal with through waiting. Um, because if you can deal with that through screening or through sampling, then you've, in theory, solved most of that problem. Um, so I, I don't think it's really an issue, an issue that you wait away. So unless you're doing a, a poll just of Douglas County because of some issue or candidate who's running here, then statewide or nationwide, those 
um, college communities sort of balance out with other places that mm -hmm. are not college communities. And but if those college students who are here just for school, if they're registered to vote here and it's an election poll, um, even if they're only living here nine months out of the year, you'd still want them to be in your poll. I think um, I have an idea that there might be a larger number of college students changing the state that they're registered to vote in. So they might like, because I come from Illinois, so now I vote in Kansas and now I'm a Kansas resident because I thought my vote might be more strategic in the state. And I wonder if that's going to play a part in like states like Texas possibly going blue. I'm not sure if that will happen, but I'm just um, interested in that kind of phenomenon. Well, possibly. So um, mm -hmm. in some, you know, one thing we see in Kansas is that our voter file in Kansas has a lot of phone numbers in it. And so sometimes pollsters in Kansas will poll just from the voter file. And so if you change your registration to Kansas, and you put a phone number on your registration, then you'd be included in that, they'd catch you. Um, with that, the bigger problem is that they often just ignore the registered voters who don't have phone numbers in the list. And that is a, you're systematically not capturing a group of people. Um, otherwise, there'd be some kind of random digit dial, if it's a phone poll or some other kind of method, where we would hopefully capture you. Um, if you are an Illinois, if you if you're if you're a Kansas voter, and let let's say I'm doing a random digit dial phone survey of Kansas, and you vote here, but you have an Illinois phone number, we're never going to survey you, and that's a problem. Um, that's a bigger problem in some states than others. That's not a huge problem in Kansas. That's a huge problem in surveying North Carolina, for example. North Carolina has huge influx of people into Raleigh, Greensboro, Charlotte from out of state who don't change their phone numbers. Uh, that is a population that leans more democratic, in fact. Uh, it's, it's whites from outside North Carolina who are playing a big role in making North Carolina a bluer state. Um, that's an issue that they have that is kind of a minor issue here. So even if we're not capturing you, the bias probably isn't too big with that. Um, the other issue related, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, the other issue related to that is how that does change the electorate of a, a state from year to year. If pollsters, if I want to, if I want to poll a state, I'm going to get my, I'm going to form my assumption of what the electorate looks like based on previous exit polls, typically, if they exist. Um, and then I'll, base my weighting on that. That's how I would, I would typically know what percentage of the electorate is Latino, African-American, 18 to 29, whatever. Um, that gets more problematic when you have states that are demographically changing. Um, we don't have a huge problem with this in Kansas, but this is a problem in Georgia, for example. Um, Georgia has not only an influx of young people from out of state who are coming to live in Atlanta, it's an economically vibrant city, but it has an increasing Asian and Latino presence in the electorate that grows with every electorate. Or in Texas, the growing share that is Latino in the electorate with every election. Um, Pollsters cannot necessarily anticipate how much those populations are going to grow in the next election by looking at the past elections. And so there is a little bit of educated guessing or fudge factor in there um, where they could be off a little bit systematically by not making the right assumptions about population change. Um, and hopefully those are things that are only going to marginally affect the poll. But, you know, honestly, there's so many sources of error in a poll that can pull your point estimates one way or another and simultaneously affect that, that you can also have these little forms of bias that come in to influence the poll, but they can largely cancel each other out. So that's also an important thing to, to, to realize. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so Druta asked about a question about um, 
mail-in ballots. And it's one of the uh, interesting and unique aspects, I guess, about this election, uh, about the number of mail-in ballots that are coming in. Can you, uh, not necessarily with respect to polls, but can you just address some of the issues that um, are that you see happening across the country as people are filing um, their advanced ballots? Sure. Uh, you know, mail-in ballots are not a problem for polling. Um, they don't, the way in which a voter chooses to vote does not really present a challenge for polls. Um, unless it's an exit poll, um, you know, back, back once upon a time, uh, not that long ago, the overwhelming majority of voters cast their ballots on election day. Um, early voting, for example, wasn't really a big thing in American politics until 2008. Um, it was a new development uh, in many states then. Um, and so pollsters have had about 12 years now to adapt to the proliferation of um, early voting and mail voting, which has also been expanding. You know, 25% of all voters nationally cast a mail ballot in 2016. Um, they've been adapting to those pretty well in how they do exit polls, exit polls being very different. Exit polls are measurements of the people who actually voted as opposed to a pre-election poll where we are forecasting an election or getting a snapshot of an election result. Um, so I don't think that there'll be a big problem with our exit polls this year with early voting because they've handled that pretty well. The exit polls in 2016 were quite good, quite accurate. When one of every four votes was cast that way, it's just that's going to be a larger share um, that they'll have to adapt their methodologies for. The bigger problem with, with, with mail voting is this year is that so many people are doing it for the first time. Um, so as I said, 2016, one of every four votes nationally was cast via mail. It's gonna be much larger in this election. Um, and what we're seeing this year is we're seeing a lot of voters who are not habitual mail voters screwing the process up. And as a result, their votes are being disqualified. So in the primaries, because we have to remember the pandemic started to happen during the primary period. So we actually have a number of primaries that happened where mail voting was a, a quite significant phenomenon. There were more ballots disqualified in the primaries this year than there were in the entire 2016 election. Um, and by disqualified, I mean, there was an error, so they were thrown out. That meant you didn't follow the directions and how you voted the ballot or you missed the deadline for returning it. Um, that is more of a problem for the election outcome and the legitimacy of the election outcome, quite frankly, than it is pollsters, um, I think. Um, there are some initial numbers coming out about mail ballot disqualifications. And of course, they're easier to deal with when those mail ballots come in early. So for example, North Carolina right now is having a lot of mail ballot disqualifications where local elections officials are having to follow up with those and get those corrected. They skew heavily towards youth and African-Americans as is the trend nationally. Um, minority voters and young voters of all races are substantially more likely to screw up the mail ballot process through directions or deadlines. Um, and so that could be an issue. Um, mail ballots traditionally don't have a strong party skew in them. And in fact, many years they favor Republicans. This year with you know, Democrats being significantly more concerned about COVID in polling, they've ordered a lot more mail ballots than Republicans have. And so those mail ballots this year are gonna skew more Democratic. So if we're talking about votes being disqualified because of errors or deadline issues, all things equal, we're probably talking about Democratic votes being disqualified. Um, and that's a concern for them for Democratic campaigns, obviously. Um, if you're following the news, you're seeing that it's getting caught up in politics. Wisconsin did a last minute change in when its mail ballots were due. Um, Judge Kavanaugh had, a, had a, an opinion where he was implying that even if state law says mail ballots can come in after election day, like they can in Kansas, that those ballots should be disqualified 
um, because he thinks that the federal government has an interest in overriding state law on that so that election day vote is privileged. Um, I think that could be, that's a big shot across the bow of what could happen after the election if the election ends up in court. Um, we may well be in a position on election night where Trump may, be appear, may appear to be winning some states, but as mail ballots get counted or continue to come in where they can come in, um, those are probably going to lean towards Biden. Um, and you know, just as a political scientist, that worries me because people are used to knowing the results on election night, when in reality, this is a process that has to play out and the leader may change. Um, and that could become very political and very contentious. Uh, let me open this up to folks who are here. Do you guys have any questions for Professor Miller? Yeah, I have a question. This is like specific to the Kansas kind of races right here, but just from a political scientist perspective, I'm really interested um, specifically with the Kansas House because we saw in a lot of the primary, the way that the Republican party kind of shifted. So I'm really curious from your perspective, which Kansas House seats you think are gonna flip in the upcoming election or if you've kind of um, delved into that potentially. Um, yeah, so then there are a lot of competitive legislative races around the state. Um, we are, you know, both parties have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you're a Democrat, you've lost most of your, you know, Republicans have done a very good job in recent years of cleaning Democrats out in the most vulnerable seats that Democrats have. So for example, Democrats don't have any seats in the state legislature left that voted for both Donald Trump and Chris Kobach for governor. Um, Democrats have some seats that voted for Donald Trump and Laura Kelly in places like Newton or Hutchinson or Pittsburgh. Um, there's one in Johnson County um, that Republicans are targeting. So, but these are seats that have a history of ticket splitting and they've sent Democrats to the legislature for a couple of elections. Um, Democrats have been making substantial ground in the legislature in suburban Kansas, particularly in Johnson County. Um, when I moved to Kansas in 2013, Democrats had two seats from Johnson County in the state legislature. Right now they have 13. Um, there are three seats, or th there are three Republican held seats in Johnson County right now that voted for both Hillary Clinton and Laura Kelly. Pretty low hanging fruit for Democrats. So I think People expect Democrats to be to make some some to gain some ground in the legislature in particularly our uh, more suburban communities, Johnson County, Sedgwick uh, County, Wichita, uh, the Topeka area, Manhattan and Leavenworth in particular, um, all have seats that are very promising Democratic targets. Um, Republicans, though probably are gonna lose some of those seats, but they want to be able to pick off some of those Trump Kelly seats. Um, and this will have huge implications for redistricting with Republicans very narrowly clinging to a supermajority in the state legislature. Uh, if Democrats have a net gain of one seat in the state house or two in the state Senate, they can break the Republican supermajority, which means that um, Republicans can no longer override Governor Kelly's vetoes if they unite. Republicans would like to be in a position where they have their supermajority and if they stick together, they can pass a new map over the governor's veto. Democrats would, be, would like to break that supermajority so that Kelly can veto any Republican gerrymander and then force a compromise. Um, 10 years ago, the courts actually drew our maps. Um, 10 years ago, moderate and conservative Republicans couldn't come to an agreement on new legislative and federal maps because quite frankly, they were both trying to shaft each other with their own versions of the maps and they never struck a bargain. So their clock ran out and it went to the federal courts. And so the federal courts drew a non-gerrymandered map for Kansas for both Congress and the state legislature um, Lots of competitive districts that have preserved Republican majorities, uh, but there are also districts that make sense based on city and county lines. Um, it's a map that Democrats would probably be happy with, but it's a map that Republicans can do better. 
um, by doing things like breaking Johnson County up between a couple of congressional districts. Um, so that's really the politics that's going to be at stake with those legislative elections. Um, and we're really just going to have to do the seat by seat math as those results come in. But look to suburban Kansas um, throughout the state, but Johnson County in particular, um, for most seats that will be competitive. Other questions? Uh, yeah, so you said uh, like uh, what that Brett Kavanaugh, like he said, uh, like federal law that uh, ballots need to come in by election day. Uh, like when, when will that be decided? Uh, like when, when will we know like if ballots that come in after election day, if those will be counted or not? So, so he had an opinion that it's, uh, it was in a case dealing with Wisconsin. Um, so, so mail ballot rules vary by state. In Kansas, you can mail your ballot on election day. And if it's postmarked by election day, it has until the Friday after the election to arrive. So you, you, you really have to get out of your head this idea that we have one election day. Today's election day, because you can go early vote and you should lead center pavilion on campus or downtown at the courthouse if you haven't done it yet. Um, in other states, those ballots actually have to be back to election officials by the day before the election. So the rules are gonna vary. And some states under their law for a long time have allowed those ballots to come in after election day, um, both for regular ballots and military overseas ballots. That is very political this year because mail ballots are more democratic. And we've seen Republicans changing the deadlines on when those ballots are due in several states. And so the Supreme Court was asked to weigh in on uh, those changes in Wisconsin and they upheld that Republican change in Wisconsin. Uh, meanwhile, in North Carolina, they upheld state law that allowed those ballots to come in after election day. So we don't have a uniform um, ruling at this point in time, but Justice Kavanaugh, you know, you hear like activist judges, right? Judges are political, they're partisan, they're ideological, they always have been. Liberal judges have some areas where they're activists, conservative judges have some areas where they're activists. One area where conservative judges have been much more activist is in expanding the power of the federal judiciary over state election laws. Because something like when ballots are due is governed by state law. And that's an area or redistricting in Pennsylvania, if you followed that struck down by the state courts, um, where conservatives have often been on the losing end because of state priorities on election rules. Kavanaugh and a number of other more conservative judges have been trying to put more of that power in the hands of the federal courts to overrule what state courts are saying or even to overrule state law um, if they think that the federal government has an interest. So Kavanaugh's rationale simplified was that there is an interest in knowing the winner on election night. And because of that, we should privilege the ballots that are, are, are known on election day. And that ballots that come in after election day because they could change the outcome of the election should implicitly be disqualified. Uh, now, his ruling, it's a concurring opinion, it does not carry the weight of law, but we have seen in the lead up to the election, um, the start of that rhetoric around um, discrediting mail ballots and the deadlines around mail ballots, and it's not out of the realm of possibility that um, if we have a close election outcome, that we're going to see that go into the courts. Uh, you know, President Trump's campaign has already clearly said that if mail ballots are what could determine the election, then they're gonna take that into the court system. And so Kavanaugh's opinion in that case is really laying down for him, his opinion that no matter what state law says over state election law, he believes there's a federal interest in negating that law if in his mind, it privileges the election day outcome. Um, not every conservative judge was on board with that, but 
I think it signals where some of this could go after the election if the mail ballots become the subject of a federal court case. And, and then you, uh, like say you have a, a poll that comes out today, like Biden winning Pennsylvania by like two points, like a Fox News or CNN poll. Like when, when would it, you say that data was collected to, for the results of that poll? I mean, whatever dates they had in the polling memo. So, so like, uh, if I'm saying that like if Fox News comes out with the poll today, like they didn't ask the respondents today, right? Like probably takes weeks to collect data for a poll or? No, um, a lot of election polls these days are done in just a couple of days two, three days. Um, I'm sure if, if a poll comes out today, it was done within this last week. But that's, that's not gonna be impacted by the issues that you just asked about. Um, the issues that you've asked about are gonna be, are gonna impact the vote count um, and whose ballots count and whose might not. Um, that's a very separate issue from the polling. Other questions from you guys? I think I'm also just curious with like the Kansas, um, or not Kansas Senate, US Senate race in the, um, for Kansas, kind of what with, especially with the upshot poll that kind of just came out. Um, I don't know what kind of polling that's coming out here have you found to be the most accurate? Um, I, I mean, and from my understanding, right, there's still like not as much compared to other states in Kansas exactly of polling for that race, right? Yeah, um, so a couple things there. So, um, you know, Kansas, we're not normally a swing state. So polls, there's not as much outside interest in polling us as there is like a North Carolina or a Georgia. Um, and in fact, that's that encourages some pollsters to actively avoid Kansas because they don't have a track record here of knowing what the electorate is like. They're not intimately familiar with our history. Um, and you know, states like Kansas in that regard often get intentionally ignored because pollsters might think, oh, I have a greater possibility of going wrong here if I wade into this. Um, so for our Kansas Senate race, that's meant that the vast majority of the polling that we get is from candidates or campaigns, you know, interested parties. But that said, some, sometimes that polling is very accurate. Um, the most accurate polling in the 2018 governor's race was actually Laura Kelly's own campaign polling, um, which her opponents dismissed as flawed, horrible, wrong, but it was damn dead accurate. Um, in, the, in the Republican primary, the most accurate polling was Jeff Collier, the incumbent governor who Kobach defeated. His polling was really, really good. Chris Kobach's polling was not. Uh, his polling was pretty systematically off. Um, so candidate polling and party polling, I mean, you have to remember most of the time their pollsters are only polling elections so that they can go to corporate clients and say, look how accurate our polling is. Um, elections are one of those few opportunities that you have to validate polling. And there are actually very few pollsters who exit, who make their money primarily on election polling. They wanna be able to go to Walmart and Coke and NASCAR and say, look how accurate we got this. You should give us that $10 million polling contract you have. Um, so there is an incentive for accuracy, even if it's a partisan or campaign source for the poll. Um, Despite all that in Kansas this year, we've had a very remark remarkably consistent polling history. Uh, you know, you've learned about the, the margin of error. Um, there is functionally no difference between a poll that shows Marshall up to and a poll that shows Bollier up to. Both polls, there's no, there's no clear leader. Um, the only two polls that we've had in this entire campaign that deviate from that picture of no clear leader are two polls that came from a super PAC supporting Roger Marshall. If we believe those, then he's ahead like 13 points. No one else has shown that. Not even other Republican polling has shown that. 
Um, so regardless of the source, the story we have is, is really is pretty consistent that among voters who have an opinion, there's no clear leader between Bollier and Marshall. But your undecided voters in the Senate race, they are more Republican leaning in the sense that um, there is a chunk of those voters who are also undecided in the presidential race. Maybe that's accurate. Maybe they don't show up. Who knows? But among the undecided Senate voters, they do lean to Trump for president by about a two to one margin, which underscore, and we've seen that consistently in polling, so which underscores that logic that if Bollier is going to pull it out, she has to get those Trump ticket splitters, you know, your soft conservatives, soft Republicans. Um, and they're very much who the election is being fought over. Um, so I've actually been impressed this year with how consistent the polling story has been in, in, in Kansas. And of course, they're undecided. And, you know, we don't know how they're going to break. Someone has to win the race by some margin. We don't know how big. Um, but, you know, I think we are in store for our closest Senate race we've had in the state in quite some time. All right, last question. Uh, are polls getting more accurate with time or less accurate or neither? Do you trust the polls this year? Uh, the answer is neither. They are not getting less accurate or more accurate. Um, and in fact, um, polling has been very resilient to some of the changes that have made it harder to do a poll. Um, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, polling was overwhelmingly done on phones, but landline phones. Um, you know, pre-cell phones, pre-web-based samples. Um, and, and that was basically how it had been done for decades. Pollsters knew how to do that very well. And then starting in the 90s, response rates started to plummet. You would be getting 40 or 50%. Now you're going down to five or 10%. Um, a lot of that came from caller ID, people could screen their calls. Um, a lot of it came from the proliferation of the telemarketing industry in the 90s. Um, and having been alive in the 90s, I remember many an evening where the home phone would ring nine or 10 times, it was people trying to sell you things. So of course you didn't, you didn't know when Gallup was calling and you didn't pick up. Um, and so that was a cataclysmic change in the polling industry where you had response rates crater by 80%, you know, 50 down to, down to 10. Yet it didn't impact the accuracy of polling in any way because it turned out that decrease in the response rate was pretty randomly distributed across the public. Um, it didn't skew the polling systematically one way or another. So even though we've had some great changes in the methodology of polling and some big issues and things like response rates they've had to adapt to, it hasn't had an appreciable systematic overtime effect on polling accuracy. Um, of course, any one poll can by chance be inaccurate. Um, most polls are in the ballpark, which is how you consume a poll in the ballpark, not as an exact estimate. Um, so stability is really the story for the, for the most part. So you would say the polls today are fairly accurate? Yes, I mean, even the polls in 2016 were fairly accurate. But when you're talking about a 2% discrepancy that in a close race that then changes your expected winner, uh, in a margin of error world, a 2% discrepancy is nothing. Um, it's everything when you're expecting Hillary Clinton to win a race by 2% and then Donald Trump wins it by a fraction of a percent. Um, so polling is generally pretty accurate if you know how to consume it correctly, which is an estimate with uncertainty around it, not as an exact um, pinpoint estimate. And I would just say for polling this year, uh, you know, we have several years of elections again since 2016 where we have remedied the waiting issue. Um, voters are a lot more stable this year. It's possible that a week from now, we'll be looking back and say, you know, some, something was different here. We made an error and then start studying that. Um, but there's nothing that's obviously on the radar right now that says 
glaring potential for error here. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Professor Mueller, thank you for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the good questions. Um, thanks, guys, for joining us today. If you haven't voted, go out and vote. Um, and I will post some stuff over the, over the weekend, and we'll connect again next week if you would like. So till then, see ya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.